Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Game to the Comp video, we're going to be discussing RX Vega again. Specifically, there are most likely at least three distinctive Radeon RX Vega SKUs, with the slowest being slightly faster than a GTX 1070, while the fastest is giving a G GTX 1080 tire run for its money. It's actually slightly faster than that. We'll go into the benchmarks and how we come to those conclusions in just a moment. And then we're going to finish the video discussing the Xbox Scorpio, specifically the development kit. It's not the biggest piece of news, but it's quite interesting because of the developer kit, we actually have an overview, a video, of the entire developer kit, and it includes, out of all the things in the world, a frame rate counter on the front, but we'll go into that in just a moment. First things first, let's talk about Vega 10. So, just all on the same page, because I am still getting a few messages asking to explain the whole Vega situation. So, I'm going to give you a too long didn't read. Vega 10 is the high end, Vega 11 is the slightly lower end of the cards. Polaris is the predecessor to Vega, and they are very different architectures. So, the early reports, and this is perhaps the more confusing, is that Vega and Polaris were very similar to one another, with Vega essentially being a very small evolution compared to Polaris. It would have a large number of compute units, in other words, more than 36 of the um, RX 480, also known as Polaris 10, but with a different memory controller and HBM2 memory. That was the original rumours, which persisted for a number of months, quite a long time, in fact. That wasn't the case, and instead, we've now found out that Vega is essentially an entire new architecture. It's featuring NCU, which is about the largest jump from AMD's own words, not my own, when I was discussing this with AMD, they, those, that's what they told me, is about the largest jump they've actually had in a graphics architecture since the introduction of GCN. Okay, now we're up to that, what do we know about the card itself? <clears throat> well, foregoing the specifications for a moment, a couple of folks actually messaged me regarding further benchmarks for the various GPUs. So, this tells us that there are at least three different variants of Vega. Now, the important thing is that the first four digits of the code name are all the same. They are 687F. The difference lies within the final two digits, or I guess final two numbers. Um, they are C1, C2, and C3. It would appear that the graphics cards go in order of magnitude. So the highest end card is faster than a GTX 1080 Ti, whereas the lower end card obviously isn't as fast as a GTX 1080 Ti. It's just slightly pipping a GTX 1070 to the post. We have a couple of benchmarks which give a detailed explanation. For example, in TimeSpy 1.0, the card, which we assume to be the high-end Vega, is getting 9,753. To put that into any level of context, a standard GTX 1080 Ti, I say standard as in it's not manufacture overclock, so if you were to buy like uh, an Acer Strix or, you know, some Gaming X variant of the card, obviously those have higher clock speeds, and that's an unfair comparison because you're already giving a final retail card, you know, that extra kick, which, you know, um, let's face it, is not exactly fair, but... A GTX 1080 Ti gets around 9500. Compare that to a 1080 which gets around 7400, or finally a 1070 which gets around 6000. The lower end part gets around 6000 for Vega as well. So in short, these cards are very interchangeable with a GTX 1080 or 10 sorry with the GTX Pascal series. There are a couple of caveats, and you probably can guess what those are immediately. The first is the score with the high-end Vega, whatever that's end, end up being called, is with a Ryzen 7 1700X, whereas the other one, the lower-end Vega, has a CPU of a Ryzen 7 1800X. Does that make any tangible or palpable difference? We don't know, because we don't know the rest of the specifications of the card, we don't know overheads, we don't know the memory timings, we don't know a lot of stuff. And so because we don't know that information, it's very difficult to start making meaningful comparisons. For example, we don't know whether the creator's update had been applied to Windows, we don't know whether you know, the memory timings were as tight, we don't know if it's the same memory or running at the same clock speed, we don't know driver revisions. 
and also the same processor doesn't denote the same clock speed. So you could still have a Ryzen 7 1700 and just overclock at the same speed as like a 1700X or even an 1800X. And yes, you know, really the games or whatever would detect a Ryzen 7 1700, but the clock speed, well, yeah, I think you get where I'm going with this. So overall, this reinforces previous rumours that we'd heard that the C3 derivative is around the par on par with a GTX 1070. And this is why I said, you know, just a couple of days ago that I'm not worried about these reports. We don't know the circumstances of the report or the benchmarks to be more accurate. Does that mean that I feel that Vega is got anything left in the tank? Probably. Um, I'm basing this upon the fact that the drivers are not, you know, probably fully mature. They're not retail ready. I'm not going to, however, say that it's going to be 40% or whatever faster than Pascal, because honestly, I don't know. I do not have Vega in my hands. The big questions for me regarding Vega, and there are a number of them, but I guess the three largest ones, A, what is the clock speed running at at the moment? The early reports tell us, and, you know, basic math and analysis tell us that Vega should be hitting at least 1500 megahertz, probably around 1530, to hit the 12.5 T-flops of touted, uh, performance, FP32 performance, is this the case? Are they running at this clock speed now? Are they running at lower clock speeds? For example, 1200 MHz, 1300 megahertz. Well, one benchmark does tell us that the GPU is running at 1200 megahertz, but whether that's being misreported or not, we don't know. Therefore, I'm not confident to say that it's running at 1200 megahertz because at the end of the day, beta drivers, whether 3D Mark is 100% detecting the clock speeds, I'm not 100%, you know, ready to say that. First, the second thing, what is the situation with the actual memory itself? And I'm sorry, with the actual hardware itself, what, by which I mean, is everything finished? Are there any, you know, logic flaws in the GPU? Are there any problems? For example, is some of the cache disabled? Do they have problems with the, um, some of the compute units not working, whatever the case may be. Like, is there a couple of inherent flaws they're trying to tweak before the final retail-ready silicon goes onto our shelves? Last point, what is the state of the drivers? The early reports with the drivers when Vega was very first shown off back in the day with both the Doom demos and the Star Wars demos was when all the Vega drivers just sucked. Uh, they were essentially Fiji drivers just with a few tweaks here and there and a couple of patches here and there. And basically that meant that you had quite a high CPU overhead and presumably that was also hurting um, just the GPU's performance as well. Whether that's the case anymore, whether there's still room left to work, don't forget, just a small tweak in drivers can increase performance 10, 15, 20%. And that's not anything new. Like, even right now, with the Pascal architecture and the Polaris architecture as they are, AMD and NVIDIA, to both of the company's credits, are still releasing driver updates to improve performance of games which are just coming out. So it wouldn't surprise me if AMD still have some tweaking left in the tank. Is that the case? We don't know, ultimately. Vega is looking to be one of those graphics architectures where, frankly, I'm hoping it's going to be more powerful than Pascal. How much more? Well, and this is kind of the problem, it depends on the release date of Volta. So, for example, if Volta is going to launch this year, let's, just for the sake of argument, say Volta launches, I, I don't know, let's say, let's be pretty optimistic for the sake of this, let's say October, then really, if Volta is even 25% faster than Pascal, that means AMD are going to be in some real problems if um, Vega is not significantly faster than Pascal right now. On the other hand, if Volta does get some problems behind its release, and, you know, I guess in eyes of AMD, they kind of hope it does, and it doesn't launch till, let's say, February next year, so let's be, you know, very conservative with the release date of uh, Volta, although a lot of reports are telling us it will launch this year, but let's assume that those reports are bogus and say that it, very conservatively it launches next year, then I guess Vega isn't such a big deal if it's not massively faster than Pascal, even if it's like 10%, because that means that AMD can say, hey, 
but it's still got the fastest graphics card. And that means that, of course, NVIDIA are going to have to cut their prices. So it's all kind of up in the air at the moment. The last thing I'd like to say to you, and this one is pretty obvious, this is not demonstrations with a wide suite of games. We are not looking at this running, let's say, Doom. We're not looking at this running Ashes of Singularity with to Tomb Raider in there and Hitman and God knows whatever else. No, these are just a couple of benchmarks. And I'm going to make an assumption on the part of AMD here that they're probably running these demos more to get an in-house example of the performance rather than actually comparing it against another architecture. They're probably trying to figure out, okay, if we tweak this, what's happening on the back end? Is this improving performance? Okay, cool. Um, you know, is, is it still stable when we're doing this? You know, does it crash when I'm running that? And it's, it's just pretty easy to run a, a demo like Time Spy rather than having to play the games. It's just good just to be able to click a button. And, you know, it's a very strenuous and very stable graphics workload. In other words, you know that if, for example, you get visual artifacts on this particular section, it's going to be consistent in that section. So you can tweak something. So you can say, okay, obviously there's a problem with like the pipeline here, or there's, you know, obviously uh, this particular uh, engineering sample has problems with, let's say, some of the TMUs. So maybe let's try disabling those and try doing it again or whatever. Finally, um, and this one's a very quick video, a uh, part of the video rather, let's talk about Project Scorpio, shall we? So, Project Scorpio, I don't think I need to tell you this, but I will, for those who don't know, is the evolved version of the Xbox One. It is featuring a vastly more powerful GPU, a more powerful CPU, uh, has 12 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory, and overall is supposedly going to kick ass. The figure we're always hearing, of course, is six T-flops of floating point performance. And according to Phil Spencer, they have confirmed they are going to be fully unveiling Scorpio at E3 this year. So there is a very short video that's popped up on the internet, thanks to Jez Gordon. Excuse me, Corden, not Gordon. Which shows the, well, development kit of Scorpio. And I actually think it looks really cool. Another really interesting thing is that we actually have a frame rate counter on it, combined with read and write speeds, which I'm assuming are going to be for like the hard drive or what have you. FPS is locked at 60 pretty much in the video we're seeing here. There are already calls of people saying, I'd love to see this frame rate counter in the final uh, Scorpio build. I don't necessarily know if it will be, because obviously that's going to increase the cost and... You say that you're happy to eat the cost. Well, yeah, that's, let's say that this can increase the cost like 10 20 $30. We don't know how much it will cost, but it's probably going to increase it somewhat. Plus, it also might increase the overheads of the system as well. Then Microsoft may not decide to. Either way, it does look kind of cool. And I think an LCD for other uses as well, if it wasn't just for the bragging purposes of like frame rate. So let's say it was to do other bits and pieces. Um, let's say game EVR or whether the console was on or the charge of your controllers. That would be kind of nice, actually. On-screen display of showing the battery power of each of the controllers that's plugged in. What the Wi-Fi signal's like. Those type of things would be kind of nice to be able to just type, uh, toggle through the display. And yes, of course, you can get those on on-screen display by pressing the Xbox button or whatever. But... You know, sometimes you just want to quickly glance, but let's face it, for the most part, you're not exactly going to be seeing that anyway. Last thing, and this one's probably going to break a lot of people's hearts, well, I guess it depends on if you like the development kit aesthetic or not, it's a development kit. So, for all we know, it's not going to look like that at all, and it could actually have the, you know, be inside a metal alligator type of shell, for all we know, in the final revision. Kind of curious, actually, how it looked, because a lot of people blasted the looks of the original Xbox One. I actually didn't mind it at all. I I mean, I'm, I'm recording this actually looking at a PlayStation 4, uh, the vanilla version, the original version, <clears throat> although I do have the PS4 Pro, and I didn't mind either console. I thought both looked kind of nice. I did think the Xbox One was a little big for my taste, but personally, I kind of liked the look of it, but... Then again, I was one of those weird people, really weird people, that actually liked the Duke controller of the Xbox, the original Xbox. So I probably am not the best person. I don't know, it just felt comfortable in my hands. I've got pretty large hands, so it felt kind of nice to me. Although I will admit the the uh, redesigned uh, controller for the Xbox actually felt really nice. And very off-topic, um, very off-topic, I don't understand physically how they went from the D-pad of the original Xbox, especially the redesigned controller, 
to the D-pad of the 360. I don't understand what they were thinking because the original D-pad for the Xbox was actually pretty nice and then you went to the 360 pad and you were playing a game like Street Fighter and you're like, well, I did have skin on my thumbs at the beginning of this. Not so much now. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Bit a bit rambly, but uh, yeah, it was a thing. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.